Hi everyone, Dan Gunner here from Insane Forensics. Welcome back to Tech Talk Tuesday, where every week we try to give something to help your threat hunting and security program. And today what we're going to dive into is the PowerShell event logs. We're going to cover a quick overview of what they are and then how you can use them to threat hunt. So jumping right in, so the PowerShell event logs, when you view these logs, they're under the Event Viewer, Application and Service Logs, Windows PowerShell. Important thing to note on these is these are enabled by default. So unlike some of the advanced auditing ones that we looked at in past weeks, um, these are actually enabled by default, which is great news when you're looking for PowerShell-based malware or you're looking just for malicious behavior or activity that you think happened through PowerShell. Because what we're going to see is the events from the script kicking off to using providers to ending, all of this is audited by Windows by default. Um, certainly there are audit settings you can turn up, but today we're going to cover the default set of logs. So something important hopping right in is knowing the life cycle of the script. There are three event IDs that are really important here. So event ID 400, this is what's called engine change from none to available. When a script starts, you're going to have a 400 event. <clears throat> you know, when a provider started, so these are components that scripts can use, things from registry rights to um, disk access to other kind of common behaviors. You'll see event ID 600 when providers are used. We'll talk about these a little bit later when we get to the provider slide and when we show what's actually in these logs. Finally, when a script ends, you'll have a VIN ID 403. And this is what happens when the official term is engine change from available to stop. In this case, the PowerShell engine was running and now it's stopped. So PowerShell scripts exhibit generally this following life cycle. What's important to know is sometimes you'll actually have provider events before you see the 400 event. Um, and that's all right. I mean, sometimes the timestamps um, can be a few milliseconds off. It'll throw off the order, but we'll see a bit later how to kind of correlate these to the same script. So hopping right into a 400, we talked about it. The significant fields to note on this, and if you're using, you know, some of the Python libraries for accessing event logs, you'll get these in the Python variables. But when you actually look at event 400s, you'll have the host application that called PowerShell. That's in the host application field. Sometimes you'll see command name, command type, um, the command path and command line under there. In this case, we see the script that kicked off um, was a host application that called PowerShell. Other important fields in here are the host ID and the Run space ID, this can help you when you're looking through your PowerShell logs, identify what belongs to which specific script. And then of course, the other field that's important here is the timestamp. When you're looking at PowerShell scripts kicking off, this is all it takes. What's interesting here is, and what's important to note is, with that host application field, in this case, it's all in text, Attackers are known to also put base64 values in here to break it up. So it's harder when you try to script looking at this field, it's harder to see, hey, what exactly is happening here? We'll talk a little later about what this script actually does, but this is a good example of an event 400, which kicks off when the PowerShell engine starts, when a script starts. So in this case, this script, actually creates two registry keys. Um, breaking down each part of that script, if you look closely at host application, we have our tack command, the um, at sign, and then parentheses. This is what's called a call operator, and they're basically running scripts here. In this case, that creates what are called new item properties to create the registry key. That new item property is a PowerShell commandlet or PowerShell you know, function or block of code that can create properties and set values. What you have here provided in the TAC path then, it provides a registry path. So this is how we know we're using the new item property TAC path. We're creating a registry value at this path. The TAC name field is the name for the new property. So this is what the key value of the registry field is going to be. We then have property type. This is the data structure that the value of the key is going to be. 
Um, in our case here, we actually have a string. There are other um, types that this can be. And then our value to set. So tack value, what's the actual registry value going to be here? Um, this script that we saw in this, we pulled this off of a engineering workstation off of an industrial box that we have in the lab. In this case, this script logged the creation of two registry keys. So event 600, so when a provider is located or when a provider is loaded, and again, these are kind of imports, if you will, functions that um, either afford operating system features or actually users can write their own providers. In this case, we have the registry provider that's loaded by this script. Again, we see the host application and some of our other fields like host ID um, is the same so we can correlate it with what's starting. We also have the timestamp. In this case, we know that this PowerShell script is going to use the registry. It's pulling in that registry provider. And so this is very interesting because looking at these events, not only can we see what a given script uses, but if something happened in our registry and we wanted to look across and we thought it happened by PowerShell, what we could do is look for PowerShell executions that pull in the registry provider and say, okay, what PowerShell scripts, you know, modified the registry. This is a good opportunity to kind of do what you do when you're looking at dynamically linked libraries with imports. Um, this is the PowerShell equivalent. So providers that the script that we showed brought in, so it brought in registry, it brought in alias, it brought in environment, file system, function, and variable. Like we said, you know, this is very interesting to see what a script does or what it relies on. Um, Built-in providers, this from the Microsoft page. If you look this up on Microsoft, they have examples of this. These are built-in providers that ship by default with Windows. What's also interesting is that a user actually can write their own providers too. Um, so again, when you're looking at the behavior of a script and what it did on a box, understanding what providers it brings in is critical. And how we do that is with these event 600 events um, to see when the script actually brings providers in. So finally, we talked about the script starting. We talked about it bringing in providers or other dependencies. Now we're going to talk about event 403, which is it shutting down. Again, we have our host ID, we have our run space ID, so we can correlate it to the original script. Um, we still have our host application that called PowerShell and we have our time stamp. What's interesting here, I've seen some approaches to some PowerShell based malware where actually some of the values like uh, the command line or other things change, right? If people modify the processes and they aren't mindful of if they modify some parts of this, sometimes you'll see Windows actually log different values um, in the command line and other fields of this. So doing a diff between this event and when the PowerShell script starts um, might, you know, it might show something weird happen during execution in this process. So today we did a quick overview of the life cycle of PowerShell event logs. We talked about what an event looks like when the sh script kicks off. We talked about providers bringing in those dependencies. And we talked about looking at the logs that happen when the PowerShell script sh runs or when it stops. Important thing to note again, these logs are all created by default. So unlike the advanced auditing ones we've talked about, um, these are going to be in your Windows event logs generally by default, which is good news um, if you're threat hunting in these. Thanks for tuning in this week. We hope to see you back next week.